So this is this is a typical French buffet, only two doors. Um, but as we were alluding to earlier, this entire piece of bull marketry has come off and has been put back down. So some excessive excessive damage from adhesive failure. Um, and this is an inset cast frame held together by some nails and. Uh, and again, a lot of trials and tribulations as this thing is going back and forth. And as I can see here, here's another piece that's sprung out. So it's, uh, it's, it's a chore to get rid of this. And we're seeing a lot of excess glue here, which we talked about with the other panel under the clamping force. We're going to take this down and let's talk about this, uh, and talk about this piece of furniture. So what makes the French very interesting is that they moved around to a lot of different chateaus and castles. You know, starting back in probably the, uh, the 15th, 16th century, right up through the 18th century. And everything had to be knocked down. So this is no exception. So this could have been moved three or four times a year. Whatever season, you know, whatever uh, aristocrat liked to be at a certain place at a certain time. So this guy um, has a series of, of these bolts, these eye bolts, which you can put a, uh, like a pick in or something to turn and tighten this. It has one in the top and two in the bottom. And what happens is this whole top will lift off. So the whole thing disassembles. The top comes off, the sides come off. So you have a base, two sides, and a, and a panel back. And you can see what's happened in the panel back here is from excessive heat and, and dryness, you get a lot of shrinkage here. So I have to deal with that. So I'm going to do some rehydration here, just putting a putting some humidifiers inside this and rehumidifying it and bring it back up to normal. So we are in a humidifying state right now, the middle of April. Okay. Um, so the piece is made of oak with an ebony ground. So all the black that you see here at the bottom, the entire sides, the base of this is covered with a 16th plus to an eighth inch thick piece of ebony veneer, Madagascar ebony. And here's ebony here. The molding is made of ebony. And then this, this piece of marquetry was made. This whole piece of marquetry was then inset into the ebony. So there was a, an evacuation the entire length of the top, and this piece was glued in in one fell swoop. Now, but now what's happening is, as glue failures, you, the whole piece doesn't fail. You just have certain pieces that pop out. But this has been restored. I've done this already. So the top is done. Um, a lot of when, when this piece came in, these are called bronze mounts. These are, these are uh, colored with bronze array. That's mercury gilding. So that's using actually mercury heated up in, in a vat with gold. They would take a wire brush and stipple this and get gold on all the high spots. And then these would be burnished. So this has been sympathetically cleaned with detergent, a very light brushing motion. With Keep in mind not to remove any gold. This has totally been restored. Everything's been glued back down. Um, so again, we have a, a very mobile piece of furniture. Uh, and then it was called, remember the bull was called the, the, uh, the jewelry of the furniture making uh, cabinet makers. We also have bun feet and a casting down here. This is one massive casting U, this bottom base piece. It's one U. I can, can't imagine... Um, as, as we, we did an article in the, the, uh, the National Watch and Clock Museum about 10, 12 years ago about how the, the wax sand casting process takes place. The, 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 the mold would have been huge to do this. But remember, all these, Andre Charles Bull, he or his, his underlings, his, 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 his employees, would have cast the reverse of this, 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 this. All of these cast of pieces would have been done in reverse. And then they would have poured it the, the, the final profile in sand, uh, bronze and sand. All this had to be chased and, and, uh, and engraved and smoothed and then mercury gilding. So all these castings have been cleaned. So they're all cleaned. Uh, the only one that's not cleaned is this lower molding. So these mounts are clean, the mounts on the feet, except this one, because I'm still creating dirt and dust is falling down. And the, the biggest issue on the front right now is putting the string back. So all this was missing. You have a, a, a 5 16 thick, wide rather, piece of stringy, and then a, a 16th of an inch piece. I got the bottom piece in now, and the last piece to go is there's still a groove here, 
for a 16th inch piece. And this is it right here. So difficult to see, it's, it's 1 16th by 1 16th. I actually have it mitered at a 45 degree angle at both ends to fit in to this rectangle inlet. And I have the back side, which you probably can't see, it's been filed to give a teething effect or a toothing effect to the back to give better grip. And I'm gonna literally take this, I'm gonna end up putting glue in this very small channel that's original, and I'm gonna force this in all the way down. And I'm gonna use the typical veneer hammer, and this will be a two-person operation. We're not gonna do this today because it would require my apprentice to be here. Put the glue in, and you're gonna move this back and forth to force it into the groove. And you're actually gonna use excess high glue on the surface as a lubricant. A lubricant to move this hammer around and put pressure all the way down the length of this. So this is a process that will continue on in the next few days. And <clears throat> when, after this piece is inlet, then I'm going to go down and we're going to put a nice scratch pattern, abrasion pattern down, and then French polish this. And that's, uh, that's the process we're going through there. And that'll basically take us up to where we need to be. We do with some hinge problems. The hinges actually had broken on this. Let's see if I can look this up and show you. These hinges are nothing more than pivot points of a pin coming out. So you literally put, literally put the door in, and uh, you put the door in the hole, top and bottom, and uh, that's, that's the extent of your hinge. So they're very good hinges. But what happened, somebody hyperextended the, the door. Uh, one of the uh, museum people pushed the door in too far, and they actually broke the hinge. So that's one of the last things. But I want to show everybody, this is uh, part of what I, what I use when, when we actually start to put this in with the apprentice. We'll start to put the, the brass stringing in. We're going to use pieces of plastic because the high glue won't stick to the plastic. So we'll put a piece of plastic there, and we'll take these, uh, these nice little clamps, and we'll just pump the clamp in, and we'll put another piece, and we'll pump the clamp in. And that way, uh, that's going to that's gonna hold that string. So I'll have these little clamps all the way down the front. That'll hold the string in until it dries, until, say, you know, 24 hours from now. So it's a wonderful way of, uh, uh, you know, we're always looking for diversity and, and different methodologies of clamping just as we're doing in the clamping uh, superstructure. But, so I think, uh, I think we're going, now we're going to move to the far end. I want to show you some of the original degradation. That'll be the last section I'm going to really address uh, with this piece um, for reme re uh, remediation. So we're going to move down to the end here, and then we'll, uh, we'll take a look at that. So um, this, is, this is a side that hasn't been touched. The other side has been finished, uh, restored, uh, just to see the... Uh, the tone of the brass coming in, it's heavily, heavily corroded. A lot of small nails been put in just to hold the brass there. It's just not how you do things. You don't go drilling holes and putting nails in to keep things tight. Um, this is again that piece of molded or cast bronze. Uh, you can see all the corrosion in here, the green, it all has to be cleaned out. And uh, if we can, we're going to do it on, uh, we're going to have to remove this and, and, and do the cleaning. But as I, <clears throat> as I run my hand over this, I can feel a fracturing of the ebony veneer. So the veneer, and you can possibly see these striation lines all down here. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to rehydrate it from the back, re uh, use a veneer hammer to press it back down, and get all those, uh, get all those fracture marks out, and then re-French polish it. But that's going to be totally after I pull all the nails out and, and I fill in all the missing pieces of bronze for the brass inlay. Here's another piece of missing brass inlay here. Uh, and they did a very bad thing here. They actually filled this missing piece of brass in with a filler and then tinted it with almost like a mica powder or some kind of uh, bronze powder. So that'll never come up bright brass or bright shiny as the uh, inlet above it. And as I, you know, as I feel down the entire piece, it's extremely rough. So the surface is just in a tension point with you know, the expansion and contraction of the substrate with the veneer all through here. And I, actually, this is quite interesting because I can actually see almost a knot formation here, which would be on the substrate underneath, and it's actually telegraphing through. And uh, for me, it's kind of cool just to see that that can actually happen right here. But again, I'm going to rehydrate that, repress that, and then smooth it, and then French polish it down. And... And down here, and this is the condition that this guy piece arrived in, um, missing a piece of brass here, 
and uh, missing several pieces down around the base on the side. So this is a couple days worth of work right here, getting this back, uh, you know, back in order. So that's uh, that's kind of the next movement here with this guy. So, but uh, just a tremendous amount of work, and and the, the frustration point is here. At, once you do something, um, you have to wait a couple days to see if the adhesive took, because of all these uh, different type of materials. The the organic high glue is trying to hold together, you know, brass, bronze, veneer, wood. Um, and other things involved. So I think that finishes up here with the side and uh, I think we're going to move on to how um, some of these motifs were actually initially cut out in the marquetry form and uh, and it could be whether it was wood marquetry or the bull method marquetry. So I think that's where we'll push for next. I can actually see almost a knot formation here which would be on the substrate underneath and it's actually telegraphing through. And uh, for me, it's kind of cool just to see that that can actually happen right here. But again, I'm going to rehydrate that, repress that, and then smooth it, and then French polish it down. And down here, and this is the condition that this guy piece arrived in, um, missing a piece of brass here, and uh, missing several pieces down around the base on the side. So this is a couple. So I just want to show everyone the, uh, this is a, an 18th century, 1740, marquetry scroll saw. Uh, this was taken in a deaccession from the Chateau de Versailles um, and at one time they had six of these in the in the workshops in the basement and they made marquetry furniture. So this type, type of apparatus is called a chavalet so it's an 18th century scroll saw and the doors we just saw on our uh, bull buffet those interior panels were all cut out on a scroll saw exactly like this, a duplicate of this. Uh, I brought this back from Paris, and uh, it's a lovely antique, but uh, when I do all my uh, cutting of any type of metals, they're pewter, brass, bronze, silver, I will use this. And quite simply, um, we're not going to demonstrate using this this time. When we do the episode on marquetry, we're actually going to cut marquetry uh, using this, um, this wonderful, wonderful instrument. Um, but anyway, I'm going, to, I'm going to compress this arm, and I'm going to put a jeweler saw blade in, okay? And I will literally string it through. So if I was cutting, th there's actually brass inside of here, uh, a piece I had to cut for one of the panels of the doors. So what I'm going to do is I need to drill a hole first, and I need to attach one side of the scroll saw blade, which I have a pack of them right here, very small blades, different teeth configuration for what I need. I'm going to attach one with a thumb screw and I'm going to compress with my chest and then through the piece. And this piece will be hanging on the scroll saw blade. So quite the ingenious uh, operation here. I'll put what I'm cutting through. And this is called a sandwich or packet. Uh, so I'll put it here with the blade going through. There's a foot pedal. I'm putting my feet on now. It's going to hold this. I can't move it. And I can pressure this and release as I'm turning this and I start to go back and forth and use the saw. So it's a very slow stroke. So imagine using your, your DeWalt saw or any other scroll type saw, craftsman saw, that's happening very rapidly, talking about three, four hundred times a minute, compared to a slow con controlled stroke, particularly when you're dealing with these very thin metals. So this is the way to do it. And uh, so, uh, so happy to have this. But uh, anyway, so I, I do this, I push through and I, I turn and, and I get my piece, the piece falls out. I test it in the, the, the missing uh, inlet in the panel and, and I go from there. So uh, that entire, I can turn a 30 inch diameter tabletop of all marquetry on this. I keep turning it in this foot clamp that I'm operating now. So what an ingenious machine. And here's something I was uh, tooling around with, uh, you know, about four or five months ago. So I actually made a piece of uh, bull marquetry, or style of bull marquetry, but less tortoise. So I've used uh, ebony, an ebony background, brass, and pewter. And uh, I'm not sure if we can pick that up, but what we're seeing in here is I, I actually cut it out, I glued it down to this uh, backer board with a piece of craft paper, which is traditional, and using a high glue, and then I layered this with a file. I abraded it with a file. So this is going to be popped off and put down on a substrate. So I'm putting the teeth marks in so I get, again, a good bite with a high glue. 
So that's something I was practicing on. And then just a simple marquetry uh, in wood of uh, a couple roses. So, but we'll talk about this in a later episode and we'll actually use this uh, Chavalet. So, uh, so uh, you know, an invaluable piece to the conservator studio, um, a piece of antiquity, but yet it's getting a lot of great usage here. And uh, as far as this piece has been used at the uh, demonstration at the Winter Tour Museum and so there are several other museums in the North Atlantic States over the last 15 years. So, uh, um, so I hope everyone is enjoying our uh, video. But uh, uh, so right now we're going to show you some of the, uh, you know, some of the uh, proclivities and uh, difficulties of the piece, the buffet in question. So we're going to show you here. We showed you here how to cut it. And we're going to take you through the entire process of talk about the buffet that's in question, the bull buffet. And then we're going to go and I'm going to show you all the problems I've had with it from past restorers up until um, issues that just occurred during environmental factors. And then I'm going to show you how to disassemble bull marquetry and how to, uh, how to fix and remedy the intervention required using all traditional tools and materials. So let's get started. Studio. And uh, exhaustingly, we just talked about Andre Charles Bull, the inventor of this type of marquetry. Um, we use this uh, small frame as an example, but let's, let's go back and let's talk about the object and how it's made up and the materials that it's made up. So Bull, as we, we stated earlier, his, uh, his invention or his artistic creation was based on tortoiseshell. And this is an old fan, uh, actually from Cuba from the 1920s. And uh, I don't know if you pick that up in the camera, you can see it's very translucent. It has almost a brown, uh, a brown feel about it. Um, different turtles came with a little bit of different color variations. But as you, you'll, you'll see as our, our piece, our object here and, and the door, uh, you're going to see red. And that was uh, achieved, and we'll get to that in a minute. But the uh, primarily uh, where, where Bull took us was tortoiseshell, brass, pewter, sometimes silver inlay in the marquetry process, in the marquetry packet process. So this is essentially the, the main uh, differential that Bull provided. Um, so we'll use the door as an example here. Uh, the door, when you're creating this kind of picture, as Bull did, Bull actually created this picture, this background is all ebony. So it's from Madagascar and, and Brazil, and so ebony ground, as we put it. The background is a ground, and then we take the uh, the tortoise, and the tortoise is cut in a marquetry fashion with all this brass, and it's cut into one. And how it's done is, is you put all the all the materials you're going to cut. In this case, it was just brass and tortoise and ebony, and you make a packet, and you make a packet with those three veneers. You would have two sacrificial sides of a, of a very low-end timber and uh, they're just nailed together and then you're going to go to the Chavalet or today would possibly a scroll saw or jeweler saw at the workbench and you would cut this piece out and you would cut this piece out and you start inserting it so it's like a puzzle so and we've talked about marquetry before but so it's creating and, and it's affixing this puzzle uh, all this is put down with once it's cut out with high glue animal high glue high with collagen um, what it does is give great tensile strength, but it's very elastic. And you need the elasticity because of the, you know, the give and flow, the ebb and flow of heating season to cooling season. Um, you know, humidity, ambient humidity. So, but there's a point where this glue gives out, anywhere from, say, 50 to 75 years. The glue just gives up. Um, you know, the wood keeps going back and forth. The glue says, I'm out of here. And... Uh, and that's why this piece behind me is in here. Now it's it's in because you've had this one door alone has had 70 to 80 separate sections of the metal relieving itself. So you have a an organic glue trying to hold an inorganic material down like metal to a substrate of wood. So after all this back and forth of this panel, the glue finally says, I've had enough. Um, but in addition, what they were doing, they were adding uric acid, and we mentioned this in one of our other videos up at the Historical Society, and the uric acid actually gave more flexibility to the glue. So, so this is in because all these things were going under a total adhesive failure. Um, and I don't know if the camera can pick it up, but we have a hump in this panel. 
This panel is fighting all of this glued section down. The panel wants to, to stay in one place and the panel is shrinking in the heating season. But this is many seasons, so uh, this piece behind me and this door is somewhere dating in the 1720s. Okay, uh, So we have our background, we have how this is made, uh, and this was done on the outskirts of Paris. So we, we, can, we can tell that the, this, this piece has been under uh, the rigors of, of, a, of intense heating and cooling and, and uh, amb a lot of ambient moisture, then it has no moisture. If we can take a look, we can see that the panel is, is projecting itself as humping, so to speak, um, because the inside of the cabinet there is no airflow, but on the outside we have air and moisture going through actually the pores of the metalwork and the tortoise and the ebony. So that's going to push the panels, both panels, or both door panels, outward. Um, that's minor stuff. We can't, we, we can't do it, but it's, it's an indicator to us of what's going on, or me, when I come and address a piece like this, an object, initially. And the second thing is what's happening, and I've already put down around 150. This is showing the glue failure. There's a piece of brass that's popped up here. Um, that's why I... That's one of the reasons why I use a superstructure like this. This is a clamping structure. It's used in most upper end conservation studios. This is a very bucolic one on the Chateau de Versailles, uh, Winter Tour Museum, and some other places. So I can use these pine sticks to, to, to leverage down with clamping pressure. So what I've done, um, part of this brass stringing has come out. I clean out the, <coughs> excuse me, I clean out the gutter by scraping, and I'm inserting the new high glue, as we, we talked earlier, inserting the new high glue in there, and this is my clamping here. So, pulling these guys off. Now, these have been overnight, um, but what a great structure. It's just enough, uh, just enough clamp down pressure to keep, uh, you know, the high glue, remember the high glue dries in two situations. It dries by uh, releasing moisture, and cooling down. So the initial cool down, you'll get attack in about five minutes. Then in 24 hours, uh, a lot of the moisture goes away. So it's, it's a double-edged set of glue, so to speak. Um, so again, the sticks are for clamping, and, but you can see here that you have excessive glue. It's very difficult to get the glue in, and you've got to move quickly because it's the high glue setting up, get your clamp sticks in. So next, the glue has to be cleaned off here. It can be scraped off or it can be wetted very gingerly because we don't want to wet the surrounding background have everything come back up. You're defeating your purpose. So a little bit of water, maybe with a piece of Scotch-Brite or something like that, and a light abrasion here, and we'll get the glue off. Um, and the same thing for this piece here. This popped up. I already re-glued it once. So what I'm going to have to do is lift a little more of this up more than I want to lift up, actually, but I need to get back further. So I'm going to scrape the glue out with a very small sixteenth of an inch wide mortising chisel, and I'm going to take some uh, sandpaper, a brace of paper, or a small file and abrade the back of this, uh, of this brass, this piece of brass. And then I'm going to put high glue, and I'm going to go and I'm going to reclamp. And we'll just simulate that. We're not going to do that right now, but it's going to take too much time. So we're literally going to put this on top of the piece, put some clamp pressure, and uh, you know within a, within a couple hours, basically it's down. But I like to leave it for 24 hours. So that's essentially the main problem with this type of marquetry, particularly when you have unlike characteristics of metal with an organic glue. It just doesn't want to last well. But you need to have a glue that's flexible. You can't have an epoxy, and, and we don't use epoxy because the epoxy wouldn't let anything move. It would end up cracking the... Okay, so we're, we're back inside of our uh, clamping superstructure here, but, you know, it, it looks a bit massive, but it doesn't have to put much pressure, point-to-point uh, -point pressure. And, uh, and, it, and again, I've glued over well over a, a couple hundred places on both doors already. And uh, you're going to notice that by just feeling over, if you can't see visually, right here we have, again, we, we just talked about this guy popping up, and uh, I've already re-glued that. So I just came back, I took some abrasive, and I ran abrasive into the back side of the glue to tooth it. So to get something more for the, the, uh, the adhesive to bite to, I cleaned out the trench or the, the inset that this is going to be pushed down and clamped down with one of our uh, 
pieces of pine stick. So right now we're going to clamp this down. I'll show you how to do that. And we'll come in this this inlaid brass strip has come up again. Possibly didn't get really good clamp pressure right on the tip. So we're going to deal with that. But uh, so to, to understand that, it's, it's moving your hands over, feeling what's raised. There's also in the equation, there's also always a lot of bad repair and restoration. Unqualified uh, uh, individuals touching these kinds of things. And, uh, you know, there's a serious... Uh, there's a series of nails. These weren't required to put nails. The tolerance is when they use the pan plane and they, they, they put the grooves in here and the fillets. They were so precise. They were just a bit under the, the dimension of the brass. And the brass was forced in with a somewhat of a veneer hammer. And this is not a veneer hammer, but I use it kind of as a veneer hammer with this, this flat back. And when I, I start redoing some of these wider brass inlays, I start pulling it with some glue on the top and pulling it squeezes the glue out and it presses, it presses, literally it presses the glue down and flushes the piece of brass inlay down with the surface of the ebony ground. So that's a good thing. You can't do that with a lot of the decoration. Um, and you have to be careful about how many times this entire process, the French, uh, are funny because the French like to take in a restoration like this and the organization that owns this piece wants to take this back to the way it was the day it came out of the workshop of the maker. It begins to get a little iffy because if we see here there's a lot of actual engraving into the brass and how many times can we abrade back? We need to flush out once we've done the restoration prior to putting a French polish back on this. So there's only so many times we can do this. There's got to be constraint and say, we, we just can't cut back anymore because the depth of the engraving we're going to start to lose. So when you start to lose too much material, we have to have some constraints in there to hold off. So, um, And sometimes, depending on the organization where there's been bad repairs, sometimes they want to leave them as an educational tool for the museum goers to show that somebody's put nails in, somebody's did this, that. And just to get the overall persona, um, it's essentially illegal to use turtles or tortoise anymore. You can't bring it over uh, international lines. So um, there's a, a few companies out there, and I've experimented with over the last 20 years, of creating a synthetic type tortoise uh, using polyresins and things of that nature. And uh, so why we're, why we're here, I mean, I have a couple places I have a place right here where I'm missing a piece of tortoise. I think there's three pieces total on this. Here's a piece here also. So how they did it, um, as, we, as we saw earlier, the tortoise typically is, uh, you know, has a brown tinge to it. But many of Bull's pieces were in, in the red note. So what they did was they actually, they took the ground. They evacuated the whole center. They put a red as I would term it today, being in elementary school, a red construction paper down. They put it down with high glue. They put it down, they flattened it out. Then over that, they put the tortoise. And what they had to do with the tortoise, if, if you're looking at the tortoise here, it's, it's rather thick. It's, um, you know, it's probably a, a good sixteenth of an inch thick. So this probably holds uh, a couple laminations. So I would have to take this, and I am not opposed to using something like this. I buy antique things made out of it for the, if you want to call this an antique, I, I, I look at this antique piece of furniture much more valuable than this fan, which is thrown together. And I would take this and I would boil this in heavily salted water. And these layers of the actual tortoise shell will start to delaminate, and I'll pull them off, and I'll use that to replace any missing pieces. So first, I'm going to put a construction paper or I go to some type of painting situation in painting for this missing piece to give my, the red background. Then I'll delaminate this for my tortoise, cut it to size in the traditional manner, as we talked about marquetry. And I'll use my Chavalet, which we will talk about in another program, uh, not this one, when we do our program episode on marquetry. But I'll use the Chavalet after I do a tracing to cut the exact diagram of that piece Put more high glue and inset it and clamp with our system here and that's how you would do the tortoise repairs but right now we're just compare we're, we're concerned with all the springing of the brass so the unadhering the drying out and remember again this high glue is good 
for about 50, 60, maybe 70 years, depending on the extreme conditions it's used in or it's uh, the environmental conditions it's accustomed to. So anyway, we're going to get on with it. We're going we're gonna to glue this down. So what I've done is I've cleaned the inset, the, the groove out that accepts this piece. And uh, I've, I've abraded with a small file and a little bit of abrasive at the back. So we have more toothing area. And the same over here with this uh, stringing, this brass string of inlay. So let's get on with it. So we have to uh, work, you know, somewhat quickly. And what happens at the times we get a glue buildup. So we need to have, we need to have a good flat pressure. It can't be cockeyed left to right. It's got to be flat. So we have to be, uh, you know, flat. I'm going to use a, a kind of a dental pick to get some more glue in, but it, it does get messy, but that's the only thing we can do. So I'm going to take some high glue just sort of, and uh, get under, under the stringing. I mean, I don't have to rush, rush. And I'm going to take the, uh, the dental pick and, and really work it in so it gets in there well. Sometimes I'll actually rehydrate that with some water. But I just did this a, few, a day ago and, and uh, pulled out some excess glue. It makes life a little easier. So again, I'm not rushing. And what I want to make sure is I have good clamping surface here. So I know I can see I'm flat. I'm pushing out toward my left. I'm creating a tension. And that's it. This will set in about 20 minutes to a half hour. The initial set with high glue, cooling, and then after that, it's going to be the the the, the leaving uh, the leaving of the moisture is going to set it finally. Here's my. So let's let's do one more here. Let's do this piece. Again, um, you you get into a groove where you're not rushing because when you rush you make mistakes. So I'm going to get under the piece, get a lot of. A lot of high glue. You learn what consistency after a while. I make all the high glue up myself as far as the consistency of, uh, of the mixture. Push it down, get it down, get a, get a stick. So again, I want to make sure I am as flat as I can be. I don't even have to look up. I'm just, and I may be hitting another stick there. Let's see. So this one is giving me problems, so I'm, I'm going to use two. And, uh, you know, somebody, sometimes you can use a dowel if you like to use a dowel. And you just really want to watch where you're directing your clamp pressure, and that's the key here. So you put it exactly where you need it and want it. And uh, I'm going to wipe just a little bit of the high glue off to make it easier. So that's it. It's uh, fairly simple uh, once you have this up. And I tend to do, uh, and it's a, it's a simple process because I can be working on gilding, sculpting, other restoration processes in the studio, and I can come back in maybe six or seven hours and actually change these out and do another five or six of them. So, uh, so it's not something that you're intensely involved with at one time. So when you're done with all your clamping, you've got to clean all the glue up. And we're in preparation of final finish here. So when you're done clamping, um, all this brass has a finish to it, has a striation, has a vertical striation. Down here, the striations run this way on the ends, vertically this way and this way. So we're going to come up with some very fine abrasive pads. This is the equivalent of 600 grit on a sponge, and I don't want to go any more abrasive than that. And here was a piece of glue that had fallen off. You can just pick it off, and it doesn't stick so readily to the surface, which is nice. And I'm just going to go back and forth with a pad to get a nice scratch pattern that's up and down or vertical when this door is hung. And I, I've got some really good raking light coming in and I can see the light bouncing off back in my eye. I can see there's a lot of wayward curly Q scratches and I'm, I'm trying to put these scratch patterns back in and that's going, to, that's going to determine how the light reflects to my eye. The light reflecting to my off, off the brass surfaces and off of the, uh, off the tortoise shell. So very carefully though, because the issue is, the bottom line is this is not totally flat. We can't make it totally flat. There's always inconsistencies. Um, if we were to try and make it totally flat, we've had a lot of sand throughs, so and we don't want to sand any of the brass or tortoise. So I'm going very gingerly, but I'm putting a little bit of pressure, and I don't want to catch and lift something up and have to re-glue it. So that's, we have to really be cognizant of that. So, and I'll show you, I'm just going to isolate this one area here, and then, We'll take a look by using a little bit of alcohol 
how uh, beautiful it's going to look when we're actually going to put some French polish on. So I'm just using a you know standard grain alcohol here. It has very low moisture level in it. But uh, nothing. You can pick this up or not. But absolutely, it just explodes. I mean, and, and that's what it's going to look like when it's French polished. And it also aids and abets me of picking up any uh, any of the dirt or any other excess glue. I'm seeing some right there, and that's that's actually coming off. So, but uh, I mean, how 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 beautiful is that? So I have a little more um, a little more glue and to take off of the uh, of the brass inlay there. And because it's straight, I can give a little more pressure. But now you can see how bright the brass came up. So absolutely gorgeous stuff, and and that's what Andre Charles Bull intended this to be something striking. This was a this was a piece of jeweled furniture for all the castles and the kings of France, and uh, it commanded your attention and uh, when you walked into the room. So I think that's going to finish up with this area. Um, I think we're going to move on to explaining about the piece itself and the condition I found it in. So for now, we were just dealing with the doors. So we're coming to the end with the uh, the piece by uh, Bull, or the Bull inspired piece here. Uh, tortoise, brass, bronze, bronze mounts. So everything has been cleaned, all the bronze mounts here, here, all these insert moldings have been cleaned. Everything has been glued back down. The whole superstructure has been re-glued. We had a lot of missing uh, bronze and brass inlays throughout the piece. And I think it's it's looking a bit dazzling in my opinion. I think it looks great. And when these are seen from a distance back, it just it just blows you away because a lot of these were displayed. Remember, this was in, in Joe or Mary's house down the street. These were in castles. So um, final thing now, we're doing a French polish, and we're, we're you know which is using basically shellac. And uh, this piece deserves a gloss finish, and that's why we're using shellac. And a French polish, as you're applying that molecule of, of shellac, it's called a friction finish using the tampon. And you're stretching it and you're applying a heat by the stretching and the friction. And when you stretch the shellac molecule, it becomes very, very shiny as it's laid down. And it's laid down with the aid, as we've talked before, of using some type of oil. It could be an olive oil, walnut oil, mineral oil, something like that. Um, I'm using just a basic mineral oil slash baby oil without any fragrance. Um, so the tampon is dark right now, and as I continue to do this the next few days, it's going to alleviate all this. When this becomes clear, basically my job is done. So we're very close. So right now we have a little bit of oil over the whole surface. It's fully, fully shellac or fully French polished, and I'm just simply pulling the oil off. I'm just adding a little bit of um, alcohol to this periodically to help pull the oil off the, uh, the surface and give it just a tad bit more sheen. But you have to be very careful with this, uh, particularly, you know, in areas where the, a lot of the stringing inlay of brass has been put in. You can catch your tampon, you can rip the tampon, that doesn't matter. You don't end up pulling this out. Uh, there's been a lot of bad repairs on this piece, so um, there's only so much reinvention of the wheel I can do or should be doing in the proper restoration. Some of these repairs have been done many, many years ago, and they're going to they're stay the way they are. Uh, if it was an obvious just over-the-edge blatant repair that was quote unofficial and I've rectified that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of alcohol and, and infuse the, uh, the tampon because remember this is one of the quickest drying solvents there is and uh, tab it make sure it's not too uh, you know it's not too wet just a little bit possibly wetter than a dog's nose so to speak and uh, you know we're going to go over this whole thing and you can't stop again you can do, but what I'm doing now is I want to do full length strokes like an airplane landing. In, straight off the edge. Come in, so I'm done there. This little area here, again, I'm doing just a lot of relieving the oil. Go down the edge, around the doors. So I do the pruner first inside this molding, and then I'm going back and forth. But don't stop when you're turning. It's okay to keep the, the tampon on, but just don't stop. Again, pulling up just a tad bit of oil off here, and I'm pulling it off with the alcohol now. And I can see it as we, we showed last time. I, 
can see the evaporation factor of the alcohol. And the tampon is starting to drag a little more. That's not too bad yet. Um, we don't want it, want it to drag so much that it's going to pull our, our finish off. Again, we're just pulling off the oil. And we are about done. We're done with the uh, tampon. We're going to put a little more, infuse a little more alcohol into it. And go across the bottom. Nice sweeping motions on and off. And down the side. A little bit of glare from the lights here, but. And on this side, I can really see the evaporation happening fast, right in front of my eyes, and that's what I want to see. So I think that's about it. Uh, this, will, this will continue for the next two or three days. Um, it's, it's an amazing restoration. This was amazing furniture in its day. I mean, and uh, the, the term today, the wow factor, you want a wow factor, and this is it. There's nothing like this. But again, this is going to last for 40, 50 years. The uh, high glue adhesive, which holds the tortoise and the, the, the brass down, is going to start relieving itself because the wood, the substrate, is going to keep moving. So, you know, wait for the next restore. When I'm not here, obviously, won't be here in 50 years, maybe not 20 years. But uh, so this is going to be uh, this is going to be an ongoing project. And remember, some of the things these a lot of this uh, bronze and brass is engraved, so you can't abrade it too heavily. So you've got to go very lightly because there'll be a point where you, there's nothing left to abrade. You don't want to abrade it away. The best things for these pieces of furniture is keep them out of the light. Keep them out of natural light. Keep them in a museum setting even if they're privately owned. So um, that pretty much finishes up. Another good project here, the Historic Preservationist. So uh, Greg Perry signing off. Thanks for, uh, thanks for viewing us here.